Okay, it's real quick, folks. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. We've got quite a few folks logging in. Get started in just a moment. Great to see some familiar names and faces on here today. Good morning. Good morning. So if everybody's good. I'm going to go ahead and kick us off as other folks are coming in. We'll uh, watch the waiting room and let them join as they as they come on. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I'm Chris Purnell, Program Director for Partners in Health and Wholeness an initiative of the North Carolina Council of Churches. I'll give just a very brief overview of PHW before we move on to our presentation today on practical peace. PHW has been around for about 11 years and I see quite a few faces that are very familiar with the program and we appreciate seeing you. We started in an effort to affect behavioral health in North Carolina in an effort to reduce chronic illness and these um, complications of chronic illness. And we really have not stopped from that, that goal, but over the years, the program has certainly grown and expanded quite a bit. So if anyone is interested in more information after this presentation, we would love to talk with you. We'll put our website in the chat box and happy to answer any questions that you have. But basically we focus on healthy eating, active living, smoking prevention and cessation, and mental health concerns. Yes. Just prior to COVID, um, we were positioning, and turns out it was a really good place to be, but we were focusing very heavily on mental health concerns, as well as healthy aging. And certainly with COVID, that has, has become even more important. Our other areas of focus are overdose prevention, during COVID, you may have seen the news that overdoses are skyrocketing. So we work very, very heavily in spreading news and how to take a harm reduction approach to, um, for people who use drugs. We just recently received a grant to work on reducing stigma and providing education around HIV and AIDS. We're very excited about this work and you're gonna see a lot more of that from us in the near future and we continue to work on issues around healthy aging. We also work directly with denominational leadership. So if that is something that your denomination is interested in, my colleague, Nicole Johnson is on this call and would be happy to talk with you if you wanna do something specific with PHW. So again, thank you for joining us. Any questions, please let us know. We're happy to hang around here and answer them or talk with you later. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, the Reverend Jessica Stokes. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we're going to do the prayers of the people together. And I'm so glad you're here to join us in your own spaces. Please respond with God, hear our prayer. And then later on in the prayer, you will be invited to unmute yourself and share over chat what you have on your heart and mind and, and share with the group. Um, otherwise, lift up your own prayers unspoken as well. But please join me in prayer. With all of our heart and our mind, let us pray responding with God, hear our prayer. Dear God, we pray for the ways that the world is hurting, where there's injustice, a lack of peace. God, hear our prayer. For all that we are holding, difficult news, anxiety, caregiving, grief, and loneliness. We pray for our own lack of peace. God, hear our prayer. 
for our communities and the impact of trauma, COVID-19, racism, and more, the ways that we have kept ourselves from being the beloved community. God, hear our prayer. For all that we are holding, spoken and unspoken, and you are now invited to share over the chat or unmute yourself and say what is on your heart. Not to that is leaving some of the inflationary pressures, the higher beings that, that are impacted. We pray for those who are healing from COVID-19 and, and different diagnosis of all types. God, you know all that is on our heart and our mind. We lift all this to you. God, hear our prayer. Next slide, please. For the conflicts in our life that we need the courage to face, God, help us. God, hear our prayer. For the ways that we can be instruments of peace, God, give us strength. God, hear our prayer. For all the ways we have been sustained up to this very breath, we give thanks. God, hear our prayer. For all that we are holding, joy and grief, fears, and gratitude we share with you in your love. God, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all that we have, moments of solitude, strength during hardship, and the guidance from a God who loves us and knows us by name. Amen. Thank you all again for joining this morning. Thank you for your energy and your presence. We're so grateful for every one of you and your faith communities and, and all of who you are and, and your work in the world. I want to take a moment to introduce our speaker. We are so grateful to know Krista Westervelt uh, through our work together. She joined our, our work as a, uh, as a student in her um and her work with UNCG, University of North Carolina, Greensboro. She's a senior in the Peace and Conflict Studies and a, a gerontology minor, and she's completing her senior practicum in Peace and Conflict Studies with partners in health and wholeness. Her academic interests include investigating the role grassroots of interfaith and ecumenical initiatives, how it plays in addressing cultural and structural violence, as well as researching and addressing racial, gender, and economic dis disparities across the life course. Prior to beginning her practicum with Partners in Health and Wholeness, Krista served the Chatham County Council on Aging as the organization's development and communications director. She is a member of the Community Church of Chapel Hill Unitarian Universalist. We couldn't be more grateful for Krista and her expertise and all that she has offered to Partners in Health and Wholeness and Today is, a, is going to teach us all so much about peace and conflict. And I think that we will find it ties a lot of the themes and in, in what we learned together at PHW already. It'll tie much of it together. So thank you, Krista, and I'm gonna pass it on to you. Thank you so much uh, for that warm welcome. I wanna thank Jessica, Chris, and Elizabeth for, um, bringing me on and for offering me this opportunity to share with you and to learn together with you this morning. First, I'm going to quickly go over kind of our agenda for the morning. Um, it looks like a lot, but we're going to get this done. Um, we're going to define peace and conflict together. We're going to address some common misconceptions around those concepts. We're going to look at approaching the work of peace. We're going to bridge the values of partners in health and wholeness and peace and conflict studies. We're going to work on addressing conflict in the quest for health related justice move from awareness to action, take a look at a vision of beloved community, and we're gonna have some time for discussion and sharing some key takeaways together. Okay. Oops. Backwards there. Mm -hmm. All right, so, well, I could just dump a bunch of definitions on you guys. Um, I would love to 
kind of share with you and let's define some terms together because sometimes we might look at the terms peace and conflict. We might not, we might say those words, but we might not mean the same thing when we say them. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to kind of share with me your own definitions of peace and conflict. So in the chat, if you could for me, if you could type in what you think of when you think of peace, what is, what is peace? What words do you associate with peace? A buoyancy. Buoyancy. Uh, yeah. Salitas, whole, Salitas says wholeness. Yep. Happiness. Wholeness. Tranquility. Love those. Calm. Excellent. Shalom. Healing and healing wholeness. Love that. Contentment. Sure. Space. Those are all beautiful. Shalom for sure, yes. <laughs> Excellent, safe, okay. Intellectual, spiritual, and emotional safety. Love those, those are great. Okay, so we're gonna move on to a comfort, inclusion. Those are, these are wonderful, these are great. <laughs> I hope I, you know, I get a copy of this chat later. This is excellent. Okay, so these are some great words for peace. And so at the same time, I'd love to hear the words that you associate with conflict. Uh, what do you think of when you think of conflict? Anger. Discomfort. Dysfunction. Tension. When people get earnest, okay. Disagreement. Mental noise, ooh, <laughs> I love that description. Overstepping boundaries, revelatory, excellent. Discord, sometimes violence, growth, injustice, invasive. This is great. Tension, disagreement, opportunity for growth, discomfort. These are great, these are great. All right, so I'm gonna do, we're gonna have a quick poll. Um, see if I can restart it. Okay, so hopefully you can see the poll. If not, you can, um, there you go. <laughs> People are seeing the poll. Is conflict always bad? And I'll give everyone a moment to answer what you think. <sighs> everyone, just another moment. We've got a fair number of answers in there. I don't know that everyone has answered, but I think we're good. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share out the results. So 93% of you said that conflict is not always bad, and a few of you said yes. Okay. So let's take a look here. Okay, so one of the, well, I'll just go back actually for a second. So one of the benefits of sort of doing this exercise is sometimes um, we're in the midst of conflict, we could each have say the same words to each other and mean something very, very different. And sometimes that gets the way of communicating and resolving conflict. So having a mutual understanding of what those words mean to one another um, can be really helpful. And so you guys had some really wonderful um, words that you've shared. So we're going to go over some common misconceptions of peace and conflict. Okay. So a common misconception of peace and conflict, or excuse me, of peace, is that it, it's just the absence of violence, just the absence of direct physical violence. Um, another misconception is that it is the de-escalation of conflict or violence, or for instance, a ceasefire. We often think of of if we just get the violence to stop, that's what peace is. So for instance, um, let's say you're in a classroom and you have two students that they don't get along. They're sitting next to each other and every day in class, they, they're kind of smacking each other or knocking things off each other's desk or whatever. And then the teacher moves them to different sides of the room and then they, then they can't reach each other, they can't do it. And that's peace. <laughs> Until they get out into the hallway <laughs> or the lunchroom or the playground, right? Because we haven't resolved what <laughs> is going on between them that's making them slap fight in the middle of the classroom, right? So. Okay. The other misconception is that conflict is always negative and never positive. 
and that violence is always direct. The only type of violence is murder, it's assault, it's, it's war, etc., and that it causes immediate harm. Mm. So to continue to clear those mis misconceptions up, we should understand that peace is more than just the absence of that direct violence. So a negative peace, which is a, a pretty common way within our culture that we think of peace, um, although from the terms that you, you all were putting in the chat, I don't know that everyone here just really thinks this way. But a negative peace is a peace without justice. Um, the direct violence may cease, but the root causes behind it may remain. So it's sort of like uh, if you're sick and you spike a fever, you take a Tylenol and that fever is down, but you're still sick. And we hear about that probably more now with COVID. Like we need to have that fever gone without fever reducing medication, right? Like getting rid of the fever doesn't get rid of the disease underneath. And so negative peace is very much that same way. It's that sort of ceasefire idea without addressing the root causes. Um, and, you know, to bring it to a biblical perspective in Jeremiah 6, 14 uh, says, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly saying peace, peace where there is no peace. So it's a very um, tenuous, temporary shoving down and kind of surface level calm. That's your negative peace. Now, positive peace is peace with justice. Um, and in looking at sort of defining terms here, I mean, justice, maybe we need to define justice as well. Because sometimes sort of a conception of justice would be retribution and um, um, that sort of thing. But in this case, it's not that. It's, it's more of a, a bringing to wholeness. It's a, it's a healing kind of justice. Um, last night, I was out at Wake Forest uh, Divinity School, and they had Dr. Cornell West speak. And he said that justice is what love looks like in public. Um, so that's the kind of justice we're looking at here with, with a positive piece. And so with a positive piece, you're looking at the root causes you're identifying those, you're addressing them, and you're transforming it to something better. So it's not just stopping the violence, it's working to something, something even better than that. All right. And so there's a misconception as well that, you know, again, that conflict's negative, but it can be positive as a number of you um, believe that already. So if you want to, you can unmute yourself and share this, um, or you can type it in the chat. What are some benefits of conflict? And can you think of some examples of where conflict in your life led to a positive outcome? I know that uh, kind of looking back through the original chat, people talked about opportunity to grow. Right, an awareness of an issue that needs attention, a sharing of different views. Exactly, exactly. Um, Anyone else want to share? But yeah, there's definitely the upside of conflict will bring to light things that need to be addressed. Understand the other side. Yes, exactly. Benefits of conflict. Folks often reveal their truth in conflict. Exactly, exactly. Uh, conflict has given me insight on how I actually feel about something when something doesn't sit right. That's great. Yeah, even just sort of internal conflict, even if it's not interpersonal as well. Um, or when it is interpersonal, that, that feeling of conflict, that sense of, of bringing these things to light can definitely um, kind of reveal our own sense of truth around things. Realizing something that, this chat's going quick, <laughs> but I may be holding on to they might want to let go, true, true understanding, and pretending may decrease during conflict. Some things just need to end or be reimagined. This is great. This is great. Growth, yes, exactly. And so um, in that sense, where conflict has this opportunity for us to sort of grow and to address things that need to be addressed and change, avoiding conflict has its own pitfalls. And so there are certainly downsides of avoiding conflict and people can be harmed through that. Um, and I have some examples, but if you wanna share what you see as some downsides of avoiding conflict, I'd love to hear it. You can do that in the chat as well. Lack of truth, sure. I mean, resentment can certainly build up in those instances. Letting things faster rather than address them, yes. Never address the elephant in the room and can lead to misery. Silence, mm -hmm. Continue negative feelings in relationships. Disconnection, that's key. Exactly, exactly. 
not having an honest relationship. Sure. Oppression for groups of people. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there's, is there a few more? When conflict is unjust. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about um, the ways that we, okay, broaden perspective by confronting contradictory experiences of others. Yes, we can. Yeah, with conflict, we can definitely broaden our perspective. Um, but but um, yeah, so um, who can be harmed by avoiding conflict? One of the things you think about is if you're um, maybe you have that certain uncle who's always saying sort of bigoted things and you never you don't want to upset the family dynamic. So you don't say anything. Who gets harmed there, right? Um, and so there are ways that by avoiding conflict, we allow people to um, we build up resentment, but we can also allow people to remain oppressed because we don't want to say anything. Who's harmed by avoiding conflict? All of us. Yes. <laughs> the self. Sure. Sure. I mean, we're not allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. And there's so much that can be lost when we avoid conflict. Thank you for these great, uh, great shares. Right, gonna... I would also say that it helps to perpetuate the development of systems that sure. um, further inequity or unfairness, and it solidifies them in a way that makes it more difficult to, uh, I think, undo over time, because then it becomes more complicated. And so, yeah, I would say that. Absolutely, yes. And that's that sort of... Um avoiding conflict in those instances, right? That's that negative piece. It's like, well, we're, we're keeping everything calm by not addressing the, the things that are wrong in the systems that are currently existing right now. Definitely, yeah, it does keep it things further entrenched for sure. Let's see, there's one more in the chat. Desensitization, desensitization to hurts targeting others. That's right, yeah, for sure. That's that peace, peace where there is no peace, that Jeremiah 614. Jeremiah didn't pull any punches. <laughs> All right, so thank you for that. Um, so moving along here, in terms of violence, clearing up misconceptions about what violence is. Uh, this is, uh, Johann Galtung uh, came up with three different ways of sort of categorizing violence. And often when we think of violence, we think of that direct violence. Um, and so that could be war, murder, assault, self-harm, bullying. Etc. You kind of have a feel for what those things are. And then we have cultural violence as forms of stigma, restrictive social norms, ideologies, all of these sorts of things. And these function to justify and support other forms of violence. And I know this is sort of tendency um, to think of that little playground saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Um, but that's not true. Um, and even when you look at Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death. Words matter. The way we categorize people and speak of people and speak about even ourselves matter. Um, and those harm because those sort of back up these different ideologies and things that justify and support both direct and what we're going to look at here is structural violence. Um, and structural violence is sort of uh, what uh, Nicole was sort of getting at here. These are the social, political, and economic systems that create and perpetuate disparities in obtaining uh, basic human needs. And so these could be tangible, these could be symbolic. This could be within different policies that happen politically. This could be in the capital C church, even within the structures that we have in our congregations. Um, and none of these types of violence sort of perform in a vacuum. They all interlink. Um, the cultural, the direct, and the structural, these all sort of work together to prop each other up and to sort of sustain one another in ways that uh, really call us to uh, work toward a positive peace. Because if you're just addressing the direct, you're missing all these other underpinnings that are causing uh, long-term harm. I'm just looking at the chat real quick. Spiritual violence, weaponizing scripture, demonizing non-Abrahamic faith traditions. I mean, sure, yeah, I mean, that could be a form of, of cultural violence, you know, where we, we weaponize our faith rather than using it to heal. So that's definitely something we should look at. All right, so the work of peace. 
So I think many of you are familiar with this verse from Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the children of God. Um, but I think we don't always agree on what a peacemaker is and what they look like and who is responsible for it. Um, and sometimes I think sort of in um, kind of the U.S. sort of cultural uh, conception, you have the hawk and the dove, and you've got the dove, and you think of like diplomats, and those people are doing the work of peace. And then you have the the hawk, where it's like the peacekeeper, who, you know, the armed peacekeeper who's keeping things from popping off. But I'm interested in kind of hearing from you who you think is responsible for the work of peace and what a peacemaker looks like to you. You're welcome to put that in the chat or. Give you just a moment if you want to share. Everyone is responsible for peace, yes. <laughs> definitely, definitely. We are each called to that work. So let's take a look at that, what that looks like. All right, so this is a pyramid uh, created by John Paul Lederach. Let me just look at that real quick. Co-creator of Shalom, co-creator of Fullness of God, creating hope and healing in the world. Yes. All right. So um, John Paul Letter, I came looked, uh, created this pyramid. Um, it's looking at approaches to building peace and who's involved in that. And you'll see sort of on the right side. Um, I'm just going to look at the chat real quick. Sorry. Brandy says, I don't think peace should be the responsibility of the oppressed. Everyone should take responsibility. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So you're going to see on the right side of your screen where it says affected population, few to many. We're going to kind of talk about that. So often culturally, what we think of as peacemakers, people who are involved in the work of peace, is that level one, that top leadership. And often, if you look kind of at that, that little arrow that's running back and forth, um, the people who are at the tippy top of, of peace work are the least affected by the actual conflict that's happening. So, and those are often sort of uh, military, political, religious leaders with high visibility. So that might be in terms of like a religious leader with high, you know, maybe the Pope or something, or people that are seen as ambassadors, um, uh, diplomats, that sort of thing. And so that is focused on these sort of high level peace negotiations, ceasefires, that sort of thing. And these are the types of peace work that you might see, you know, in the news and the history books about um, these historic peace talks somewhere. But often those people who are involved in that kind of peace are not affected by what's actually going on on the ground. And so often that sort of top down peace isn't always as sustainable as perhaps it should be. And then somewhere in the middle there, level two, we're getting a little closer to the affected population. Those are sort of still respected leaders, um, humanitarian folks, NGOs, academics, uh, religious leaders, maybe at the de denominational level. Um, and so they're working on doing things like conflict resolution training, different sort of peace commissions. They're in between the sort of top leaders and the grassroots, right? And just want to look at that word, those uh, terms, insider partial teams. And this has to do with um, when you've got someone who's involved in one side of the conflict, but they're respected across the aisle, so to speak. Um, and they're able to sort of work within this in a way that um, they can create these, uh, this piece work that sort of transcends the fact that they're on one side or the other. So that's what that's about. But we, what we really wanna look at here, which is sort of the work of everyone, right? Is grassroots, the grassroots. And I think many of you who are here are, are, are there, right? So we're working, looking at, um, these are the people who are most affected by the conflict, by the violence, or who are more in relationship with those who are. So that's you know, local leaders that could be um, specific churches or groups of local churches, different local officials, that sort of thing, uh, people on the ground. Um, and that's your grassroots training. There's some prejudice reduction, which actually um, is taking place here with PHW. If you didn't get a chance to see the sacred conversation around stigma, you can check out that recording, it's excellent. And so that's sort of where we are, right? Is that grassroots. And that's where the real work comes in. Um, and I know there's this saying in harm reduction, nothing about us without us. And that's grassroots. That's like, look, you wanna hear from the people who are actually affected by it because they know what they need. Um, and so that's, that's that piece work.
And so I'm sort of understanding that we're all kind of called to that, that work of peace. Um, we kind of meditate on this for a bit. This is from St. Francis of Assisi. We're like you, likely familiar with this. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. So I want to kind of tie together sort of the values from peace and conflict studies with the values of what is happening within and through uh, partners in health and wholeness. And I'm not going to read this whole thing to you. When you get these slides later, you can actually look through. But this is from uh, my university's mission and values. And so the work of peace and conflict studies is about aiming toward coming to an understanding of conflict and actually assisting communities who are realizing the development in peace and justice. And so what that kind of means is we're gonna learn about these tools and, but we're also gonna recognize the communities know what they need. Uh, we're not gonna come in from up here and say, we know what you need, we've studied it. We already know what you want. No, no, no. It's an understanding that communities are their own participants in coming up with ways to transform uh, conflict situations that, because they're, they're the ones involved, they're the ones affected. Right. And so there's a number of different things within that that kind of tie together what partners in health and wholeness is doing. Um, but one, one of the things that's important to sort of look at is kind of that third square bullet point down, maintaining patience in the long term philosophy of conflict transformation. So it's this understanding that as much as we would love for this to go quickly and it be really easy, quick um, term solution, that it's, it's long term, it's long term work. And um, it's just learning to be patient within that. And so I think this ties together really well with the values of partners in health and wholeness. And again, I'm not going to read this all to you, but I want to take a look at the very last uh, bullet point here. No one should fear physical, emotional, or spiritual abuse or harm based upon their race, social, economic status, religious belief or practice or lack thereof, gender, sexual orientation, citizenship status, or physical or mental capabilities, especially by those in positions of power and authority. And so we're gonna go back to this really quick. So just as the same way, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can look at the way peace work can sometimes come top down. Um, violence can also come top down, right? And so our work for peace is to sort of examine and push back against some, some uh, systems that are, are perpetuating harm toward those sort of listed here. And that brings us to what conflict we're addressing. And so the conflict that we're addressing here is a conflict of values. And I sometimes know sometimes the idea of values can get a little loaded, but, um, but we'll get there, we'll listen. So, so anyway, so the conflict of values here can lead to structural, cultural, and direct violence. And so the conflict is between these two different values. Now I'm Unitarian Universalist, and our first principle is that, the, you know, about the inherent worth and dignity of all people. And that ties in here with the value from partners in health and wholeness, which is that we believe that all people are God's beloved children made in God's image and deserving not only of personal well being, but of dignity and equality. So that's a value, right? Very important one. That's something we're aiming toward. But that comes in conflict with the broader culture, society, institutions that do not reflect that belief and that value, right? So if we think that everybody, every, every, everybody is deserving of personal well-being and dignity and equality and our brother culture is like, nah. <laughs> and so the systems and the different, we have the cultural violence, we have the direct violence, we have the systemic violence that comes out of a culture that's in conflict with this value of everyone's dignity and equality. That conflict there negatively affects the health and well-being of various members of our communities, right? So we're gonna look at analyzing the conflict um, around those three different pieces, the cultural, the structural and direct. Um, and I know later on, we're gonna talk a little bit about beloved community very briefly. And interestingly, in Martin Luther King's um, Triple Evils, he talked about poverty, racism and militarism. And those kind of fall within these three, right? So racism would be cultural and poverty is systemic and, um, or, or structural. 
and militarism would be, of course, direct violence. But we're going to do some examples here around um, some things that Partners in Health and Wholeness focuses on. So we're going to look at um, these types of violence in regard to aging, just as example. Okay. So I have this little chart here. Um, in terms of cultural violence toward older adults, we have the negative expectations of the aging process, sort of this assumption that when you get older, everything's supposed to hurt. And you're supposed to move more slowly and not have energy. You're not supposed to remember anything. There's, it's just bad, 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 right? Then we have sort of the stereotypes of older adults um, that can include even this, uh, the okay boomer uh, situation that we've heard about recently. Um, this idea that older adults are a monolith, that they're all middle-class white folks and there's no one marginalized within uh, this segment of older adults. And so it leaves out uh, a lot of people who are, do not fit that, that view. The views of older population as expendable or past their prime. We definitely see um, some concerns about the views of older population being expendable around COVID-19, right? This sort of attitude of like, well, you know, around COVID-19, who, who is dying and who is not? Who is expendable? And then, of course, the lack of prestige for fields in geriatrics, uh, gerontology, and aging services. And so then we have some structural uh, violence around that, um, the onerous process around uh, exploring your options with insurance. Medicare itself is a, it's fun to sort of navigate. Um, the gaps in the social safety net, especially in this country, compared to other developed nations, um, whether that's around caregiving, long-term care, health care, um, keeping people out of poverty as they get older. We have a shortage of geriatricians, which again causes its own harm. If you go to the doctor and you're older and you have a physician who's not trained in geriatrics and just assumes that any aches and pains that you might have are just a part of being old and can't possibly be about any treatable condition, they might ignore a condition that actually could be treated um, that can cause harm. And then of course you have structural disparities in access to healthcare, housing, transportation, those sorts of needs that come with the sort of cultural violence around expectations and the value that we place on older adults versus youth. And then of course you have the more direct violence and here are a couple examples, scams and crimes targeting older adults and then elder abuse. And of course we can use this chart and look at the different types of violence related to these other focus areas, whether that's people who use drugs, uh, people with mental health concerns, HIV, et cetera. Um, and I'd love to open this up if you have ideas about maybe some types of cultural, structural, and direct violence that apply to those uh, areas. Of course, stigma is a huge one. That just cultural, just cultural violence stigma is a huge, huge one. So if anyone has any examples that you want to share, and feel free to unmute for that as well. With uh, mental health, there's a lot of cultural, structural, indirect examples within mental health as far as, uh, for instance, like a generational famil familial issue in a family that maybe a, a grandparent or a great-grandparent lived with, uh, such as depression or, or whatever it may be. But if it's not talked about it, someone in the family tree may also experience or live with depression. And it, it may be a surprise. It may not be um, efficiently dealt with or productively dealt with in a way that is holistic because in the family, we just don't talk about these things or whatever it may be. And so there's a lot of examples in mental health. Sure, yeah, 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 exactly. Even a culture of silence around specific things or a culture of shame, definitely. Let's see, all right. White supremacy structure, someone says wealth and equity that exists within that, sure. Um, negative assumptions of my mother-in-law was living with Alzheimer's, ignored in conversation I talked about is that she wasn't in the room. Yes. Definitely, yeah, we're, when people don't function to a certain degree, we then stop seeing them as people. Um, definitely, that is definitely a problem. And we can even see this um, from members of, oh, when they were coming. Assuming that elders have nothing to contribute, yes. Um, we can see this with members of the LGBTQ community. If there's a different cultural stigma around that, 
they try to get a job, they aren't welcome in their job, <laughs> what happens to their mental health or physical health, whatever. So, okay. These are all good examples. Impatience with speech patterns and searching for words, yes. And this is excellent that you uh, that y'all are talking about this. And this reminds me, I think what I'll do, um, there's a resource around aphasia and how to communicate um, like, you know, after stroke or other situations that would also apply, I think with this in this instance as well, um, for making sure that we recognize that people with different limitations still are part of the conversation. So there's actually a great resource that I will include uh, when we get those resources sent, it, sent out next week. Um, thank you, these are great. Okay, and so um, again, as you can see, there's ways to sort of to analyze these sorts of conflicts and types of violence within these categories, um, which kind of sets us up to look at ways to address them. Okay, so what are our options in sort of addressing these sorts of violence, right? When you hear the term conflict resolution, there's also this idea of conflict transformation. So conflict resolution can be kind of seen as a reflection of a negative piece. Um, it's more of a like, let's resolve this, let's get this over with. Um, whereas conflict transformation is looking toward a positive piece. It's like, okay, let's, let's just not get this over with, let's transform this into something better. And so it's the marathon versus sprint model. Now we would love for this to be quick, you know, sprint through it, get our donuts, get our coffee, and go take a nap. Um, but the work of positive pieces of marathon. And so we look at this image here. We've got this person who I, I, I'm going to presume wants to get to the top of that mountain. And there's a long way ahead. There's all these hills to get to before you even get to the base of the mountain. You got to climb it. It's a lot. That's the that's the work of transformation. It's not easy. I mean, it's pretty. The view's going to be nice when you get there. Um, and I like this verse from Galatians six nine. It's always a, a positive one. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So let's look at that, those options with conflict resolution and conflict transformation. We're just gonna do a brief comparison of the different perspectives. So conflict resolution is saying, how do we make this stop? Conflict transformation is like, how do we not just make this stop, but let's build something better. So it's really focused on sort of the relationships uh, within our communities and within our cultures, right? And so it's really constructive. It's not just, it's not just immediate, it's immediate and something better. You're engaging the systems. You're not just taking this sort of immediate violence. You're looking at the whole system within which this, this conflict is embedded and you're working to change that. So it's, it, it's a long-term response. Um, and I love sort of the view of conflict because with conflict resolution, you're looking to sort of, we, conflict's bad, so we got to make it stop. Whereas conflict transformation looks at conflict and says, you know what? Yes, I mean, certainly if people are at each other's throats, we got to get things calm before we can constructively work on this. But even though conflict's un uncomfortable, it's not bad. And sometimes we have to be willing to sort of create that, that tension there so we can get things uh, get things done. And again, this, this piece is another piece from um, John Paul Lederach, and I encourage you to look into him and his work. All right, and really quickly, we're gonna look over this integrated framework for peace building. So on the left side, we're just gonna go over this briefly. I'll have a link for you to a video that explains this a little bit more, but that left piece with the different ovals, that comes from Dugan's nested uh, theory of conflict. And what that's saying is even at the smallest level, our conflicts are often a reflection of the larger system within which we live and exist. And so it's, if you wanna resolve certain things, you have to actually look at the system within which that, that conflict comes. And then across the bottom, we're looking at, this is the, the long range look at that moving from uh, resolving it to transforming it. So yes, there's crisis intervention, but you're working toward a desired future. So what does that involve? You're gonna look at the root causes. You're gonna manage the immediate crisis. You're gonna think about how you're gonna get from the crisis to a desired change. And sort of the biggies here are your vision and prevention. So the vision is what are the social structures and relationships we desire? What do we want to see? Now, this is not a top down, I'm gonna come in and tell you what you need. This is. This is engaging with the people who are 
affected by those different types of violence and the different types of conflict and finding out what they need because they know what they need. And it's not about coming in and telling people what they need. It's about listening and about helping work together toward that, that structure and those relationships that we wanna see. And then we also wanna prevent this from reoccurring. And that, that's, it's all sort of a big piece of the puzzle. And so within that vision, that vision of a beloved community, again, this is that the, um, the interdependent, uh, inter interdependence with one another, okay? And so this quote here comes from Dr. Martin Luther King, King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. And if you have not read it, I do encourage you to do so. It will challenge you. It's really about breaking out of complacency. It's very important and very relevant even today. So as he said, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in, in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And so within that, the sort of vision of recognizing that injustice affects all of us and it's our job together to work toward this beloved community, I really love this focus on agape love because it does not begin by discriminating between worthy and unworthy. There's no worthy and unworthy. We're all interconnected. There's not a hierarchy. We're all in it together. And so agape is love seeking to preserve and cre create community. And that's the work of positive peace. That's the work of uh, working toward a beloved community. Before we get to the q and I'm just gonna leave you with this. The Greater Thing by Edward Markham. Great it is uh, to believe the dream when we stand in youth by the starry stream, but a greater thing is to fight life through and say at the end, the dream was true. So this is really talking about, it's not just vision, it's vision and action. And that's the work of positive peace. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna open it for questions sort of briefly, and then we'll have time for um, some breakout room discussion. Thank you, Krista. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions or stick them in the chat, whatever you are comfortable with. Hi, this is Solita and I, I apologize. I'm not sure if my camera is working. Is it working for you all today? Yeah, I can see you. <laughs> okay, awesome, because it literally has a mind of its own. Um, so <laughs> my question is, thank you first of all for this presentation. It was amazing. Okay. Um, my question is, um, not fully formed, but conflict, conflict resolution versus conflict transformation, which is lovely. I love it. I'm curious about the rub between the two. So conflict resolution is hard anyway, but conflict sure. transformation, I'm assuming, uh, takes more time, more sure. effort, more, it's not fast. So if you're looking for a quick change and, and often people get tired and people get um, un disinterested because we're living in a society that's kind of like, you know, microwave society. So I'm just curious about the rub between the two and how do we do transformation better or well? Um, yeah, I guess I'll start. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's an amazing question. And I, you know, I'll have some more resources around that too. I mean, I think, um, yeah, we definitely have a culture that's like, just make it stop, make it go away. Um, and we'll forget about it very quickly. I mean, we'll have something that we all get really fired up about and when it doesn't change really quickly, we've moved on to something else. Yeah. Um, we definitely have that. It's really about engaging one another and kind of maybe holding each other accountable, right, to the sustained work. And it's not going it alone. It's understanding this, this idea of community. It's a community process. It's we each have a part to play in it. Um, and rest is even a part of it, too, right? It's I think we don't allow ourselves the time to rest. We burn ourselves out. So I think it's a matter of it's definitely engaging with other people who want to do that work, um, looking at it realistically and giving each other room to rest and grow and take time yeah. um, in those times where it's not, it, it might seem daunting or like it's not going to happen. Um, and finding those places of, of encouragement with one another and, you know, coming to programs like this or, you know, where you're kind of refilling that cup. 
I think that's definitely part of it. I don't know if that helps answer your question or not. Yeah, it does. And it, it and thank you for that. And it also just, you reminded me of something that um, a mentor said a long time ago, um, also reminding us that change takes sometimes multiple generations. So that's like, yeah. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, you're welcome. And then also too, like, I think, um, you know, people have different conceptions of Sabbath um, in, in terms of, you know, different views of even in light of um, creation and whatnot. But even in the work of creating, there is a time off, right? Even in the work of peace making and conflict transformation, there's that period of allowing ourselves to rest and rejuvenate um, that often we don't allow ourselves. And so how can we give each other a Sabbath within the longer term work? And so I think that's, it's all about holding each other accountable, but also holding each other up and giving each other rest. So thank you for that question. And again, I'll, I'll include some additional resources, but it is long-term work and it can be, it can feel daunting. And I think sometimes too, I think to consider is that um, sometimes things are gonna look messier before they look better. Sometimes it'll look like you're making more of a mess than you're cleaning up. Um, and you might find this even when you're cleaning your house, you decide, you, I'm going to go clean up my closet, and then the whole room, <laughs> you're like, what am I doing? I think, you know, there's backlash behind it. There's, you know, two steps forward, five steps back. It's all a part of this process. Um, and so definitely, you know, not giving up. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm going to look into the chat. I just realized there was something in the chat. Um, Traumatic injustices, fight response gets our focus. Trauma responses of flight, free, submit, or collapse call for much gentler and quieter work of healing, it seems to me. Yes. You know, I think too, part of the work of peace is also a part of addressing trauma. I think sometimes we're so quick to uh, stop the violence, so to speak, that we don't recognize that um, maybe the physical scars aren't there anymore, but the trauma is there. And so that's a really important work as well. Um, if you have a traumatized population, um, you know, the traumatized community, it's not enough to, you know, improve the systems and stop the violence. You got to address that trauma as well. So it's definitely part of it for sure. Were there any other questions? And again, um, I'll have information where you can contact me later too, if you have any further questions. Okay. Oh, let's see. Yes, yeah, generational. Yes, trauma can definitely be generational. And I think it can, trauma can lead us to give up. And I think that's one of the things that's really important is not to make, it's important to, in doing the work of peace and in, in recognizing that, that nothing about us without us thing, it's not relying on the oppressed communities to do the work. You need to hear what they need because they know what they need, but don't make them do all the work of educating you and, and carrying everything. Um, it's not, they didn't get themselves there. Let's, let's work to help, help folks get, get out of that situation. All right. Just give another moment in case anyone has questions and we're gonna move on. This isn't a question, Krista, but sure. reflecting on what you've shared, a lot of this to me feels grounded in, we have to recognize each other's humanity first. If we're in mm -hmm. that trauma, fight, flight, or freeze, we're not seeing each other as humans and children of God. And so if you don't have that base level, it seems like you can't do a lot of this transformational work, but that could just be me sitting on zoom. No, I mean, not. I think that's, I think that's true. I mean, that's entirely where, like, if you go back, oh gosh. All right. So here with the focus of resolution transformation, content center versus relationship center. I mean, when you're looking at it content wise, you're not seeing people anymore. Um, and this is all about recognizing this is humanity. These, these are people. So, um, we, and we are people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's, yeah, definitely important for sure. All right, if there's not more questions, I wanna leave time for people to be able to discuss. <clears throat> and so we're gonna do sort of brief, um, some breakout rooms to kind of discuss sort of what we've talked about here. <clears throat> I just want to share, you know, introduce yourselves to each other briefly and then share amongst each other. Oh, I think there's one more. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> it's, it's Elizabeth putting the, the questions in the chat. Um, if you want to go ahead and 
you know, you can click on this in the chat as well. This will give you those questions so you'll have them in the breakout rooms, but there's three quick questions or maybe not quick. Um, just share with each other what insights you gained about the ways in which health-focused justice work is the work of peace. Um, start brainstorming some tangible ways to move from identifying the problem to engaging with those who are most affected by the conflict um, and, and find ways to develop a shared vision for the community's needs and create that culture of well-being, dignity, and equality. And then think of maybe some achievable near-term near goals and steps to make way for longer work. Um, and I hope that as you're sharing amongst each other on this, that other people's ideas might spark uh, some for you as well. And then when we're done with that, we'll come back and we'll have time for quick share outs from those groups. Um, and you can let us know maybe some highlights of what you discussed together. Uh, and I'll, I guess, okay. I'll see you back here in a bit. <laughs> Recording in progress. Okay, so welcome back everybody. Um, we're gonna take an opportunity now if some of you want to share some of the takeaways and highlights from your discussion that you found particularly useful or profound um, or even surprising. I'll give you each a moment to, to do that. And feel free to unmute for that. My name is Aaron and um, uh, uh, Septina and uh, Krista were actually in my group and we had some just some uh, really good sharing uh, surrounding just our learning and uh, from the city of our um, souls and personal experience uh, around the conflict. What I want to share is um, um, so Tina talked about how it's important to be mindful of people's uh, perception. Uh, can we start with this to say that it's important to practice mindful listening and also to be uh, very aware of people's perceptions of things as they happen and how it turns into internalized conflict. That's something that's very important. Um, I approach this as from the place of, of chaplaincy and interpersonal formation and counseling. So I'm very mindful of how that, that how people's family of origin and also how things that they experience, especially surrounding trauma, can greatly shape and inform their feelings about conflict. And so getting in and leaning into that. And then also what was shared and was come up is that um, I believe it's important as far as working with groups and, and in relationship um, and organizations to have some intentional grounding at the beginning to say that we will receive conflict as a tool and an instrument for growth. Because things get real when people are in conflict. And conflict can be very informative. Uh, people have a way of getting particularly sincere, you know, when there is conflict. And so, um, having understanding, as we talked about, on all conflict is ba is bad. It could be uncomfortable. Um, but to understand that uh, conflict indeed uh, can be a a tool for growth. And then we uh, all lifted up that you know it's important to, to be mindful of uh, that, that you know. Conflict is a part of the natural cycle of being in relationship and we're gonna fight, but it's important to fight fair. fair. Thank you so much, Aaron. Does anyone else like to, to share? And if, if you feel more comfortable, type it in the chat. You don't wanna <laughs> put your camera on and be seen, that's fine too. All right, I see something in the chat. Oh, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> it was in the chat from Jessica. Um, and feel free to share too if there's any other resources that you would, you know, you're interested in. You can put that in the chat as well. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to add? I'll say really quickly, um, just the couple of nuggets I'm taking away from this um, discussion and the group discussion. We talk about a lot, but. Um, just you know, recognizing that we've been in a in a uh, conflict, well, you know, high <laughs> collective trauma events for the you know concentrated the entire world, but the are you know all people we've been dealing with the same thing for a very long time. Um, 
around COVID and all the changes that have happened then, but then there were things going on before that and there were there will, there, there will be things certainly for the rest of my life to work on. And so I had, you know, I just had a lot, a high level question about what would it look like for all of us to take a rest before we made the next move, right? Don't have an answer to that. And Rod reminded um, me and us of a very um, good scripture in the Bible, thinking about the is he said, be still and know that I am God. So how do we practice that and rest as, you know, as we engage in this long-term difficult work? Um, so I'm walking away with that. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and I think so much too sort of come, I mean, there's sort of a collective exhaustion, right? After this last, you know, dragging on to nearly two years. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a collective trauma. There's unresolved grief around COVID. Um, there are a lot of ways in which the situation over the last you know, year or so has sort of really shown um, the places that we have to work on. Um, and also really um, kind of shows us at a very, very raw level how interconnected we really truly are. Um, and we ignore that to our own peril in its, in its own sense. Um, Jessica says in the chat, thank you, Salita. Really enjoyed our group. Uh, see, thank you, Salita. Rod, that scripture is something I need to hear and hold today. Yes. Yes, there is power in that stillness um, and not having to have all the answers. For sure. Is there anything else anyone would like to share or something that they, um, either from their group or something else that's come up or a question that you have on their mind that they're wrestling with around this? Um, I wanna make sure I gave everyone a chance here. Aaron says, Salita, that was a good word indeed. What would it mean for us to just pause before we launch into what's next? Yes. That sits still for a while to the, uh, what, Mary and Martha. <laughs> Just sit still for a bit. All right, uh, Rod says, vocal conflict can have the effect of silencing, intimidating those who've been beaten up through the lives, creating a safe place not to be threatened is important to me. Right, I mean, yeah, there's a way, you know, being mindful um, when we engage with conflict to meet people where they are, and where, they, where they're coming from and, and the ways in which uh, trauma could inform the way that they, uh, react to conflict. That's definitely um, a concern, something to be mindful of. Definitely, especially if you're working with groups and you're trying to find out what different um, folks in your community need, um, being aware that it might not feel safe immediately for them to share. And so it's, a, it's about creating a relationship. It's not about just coming in out of nowhere and being like, okay, hi, I have a notepad. Let's figure this out together. It's, it's developing that place of trust. Um, that's very important. Um, people need to know that you're not coming in there with any other motive other than um, recognizing their humanity. Something that everyone else present can be something. Yeah, that can happen. I mean, I think I'm gonna share some different resources for you. I think a, an excellent, um, if you've not participated in um, circle sessions or circle processes, um, there's a, those are really lovely ways of allowing different people to have their voices heard without sort of discussion, debate, verbal violence. It's about just hearing and listening and coming to understanding in a way that um, is a, a, safe pro a safer process for a lot of people. Um, and that's a great way to engage. And so I'll include that uh, with the other resources that uh, get sent out with the recording. All right. Um, well, I know we're getting kind of close to time. I don't necessarily want to keep anyone too much longer. I just want to thank you all for sharing and for engaging and learning along with me. I, I consider this even it, as I share what I've learned, I feel like it's a shared learning because I learned so much from what people take from that learning. So um, do feel free to reach out to me. Um, there's a slide with my email that we'll get to toward the end, but um, Again, thank you so much. Thank you, Krista.
Nicole, you're muted. Ah! All right, got it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you all for hanging with us. I know some people had to leave because we went into our kind of lunch hour this time. Um, and so we're going to do what we consider a couple of PhW traditions. We're going to do a closing. And in that closing, we'll do three deep breaths. Um, we'll encourage you to kind of center yourselves in the space where you are, feet on the ground, um, place your hands where you feel most comfortable. You can have your eyes open, you can have your eyes closed. And I'll encourage you to take three deep breaths, hold a little loosely uh, the things that you may be thinking about or that came up during the course of um, this sacred conversation. And I'll count off the first one and then you can count the other two silently for yourself. Um, and then after that, we'll do the benediction. You can unmute yourselves and you can say goodbye to each other or you can just tell us hello. So I'm gonna count off the first one. One. Amen. Thank you, everybody. And I think the recordings will be sent out um, for the folks who've already left.